Madam Chair, first let me thank members of the House for their very incisive questions and comments. And I think overall for their continued support to build up a solid defence for Singapore. Uh, members have asked um, many difficult questions on a wide ranging uh, topics and uh, I don't think it's possible within the short time that we have to address all the affairs of the world so we do try to address the substantive questions that you've asked. Dr. Lim Wicket and uh, Alan Lee asked for an update on the security situation in our region and I think they've summarized it very well. There are increasing tensions in the South and East China Sea. The South China Sea is in our backyard and Singapore will not be able to avoid the consequences if this region becomes more troubled or worse still when missteps are made. Further away, as you members have pointed out, North Korea has threatened to void its 1953 armistice agreement with South Korea after the UN Security Council imposed additional sanctions. Members have uh, touched on the recent intrusion into Sabah by armed followers of the purported heir to the former Sulu Sultanate, and I think this episode reminds us that security challenges can be unpredictable and precipitous. And uh, no, the Malaysians have not asked for our help, and I think they're well capable of uh, taking care of the defense challenges. Against this backdrop, I think it's more important for us to understand the Asian countries have increased their defence spending. The figures are quite telling. Over the last decade, Asian countries spent 305 billion US dollars on defence, up from 177 before. A 72% increase compared to a 12% increase in Europe over the same time period. Indeed, by one estimate, Asia's military spending is said to have overtaken Europe's in 2012. Absolute numbers. And I think some members have rightly pointed out the reason. As economies grow, countries in the region are modernizing their militaries, procuring new fighters, submarines, armored vehicles. And in this context, ASEAN and extra-regional countries must do our utmost to ensure that the region remains peaceful and stable. I think this was a point that Dr. Lim Wiket pointed out, especially with US and China. Amid these tensions, MINDEF is working hard within the platforms that members mentioned, the ADMM, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting, the ADMM Plus, the Shangri-La Dialogue, the FPTA, and other bilateral or multilateral platforms because we want to improve military-to-military -military relations, to build confidence and reduce the risk of miscalculation. Some members have asked for an update on ADMM Plus. A major effort this year is the ADMM is the disaster relief and military medicine exercise chaired by Brunei as the chair of ASEAN. I'm happy to report that when we floated this idea, both US and China are actively contributing to the exercise and this is occurring amid their renewed leadership. We have actually full support and participation from militaries of 18 nations, 10 plus 8, and this is very encouraging because it strengthens the ADMM Plus as a platform for strategic dialogue and practical cooperation. The point is that as a small country, Singapore's external environment sets our defence posture. Asia's defence spending on the whole, as I've cited, has risen considerably. Singapore is monitoring this trend closely, but for now, I think we can continue to avoid sharp increases or dips in our own defence spending. This is the most effective way in stretching each defense dollar as it allows MINDEF to plan long term. Dr. Lim Wicket said yes, we have a larger share in terms of resources, whether it's manpower or finances, and we agree and we recognize it. But steady defense spending allows, us, allows MINDEF to plan, lo plan long term and avoid the disruptive changes arising from fluctuation, fluctuating expenditure year to year. And this is why MINDEF is able to make opportunity buys for strategic assets in the past and optimize our training systems because we can plan longer term. Our defense expenditure, including this year's, has grown steadily in nominal terms but kept pace more or less in real terms 
by about 4% nominal growth annually on average over the last decade. Madam Chair, the SAF has come a long way since it was stood up. Then, when the SAF was stood up, we had only two infantry battalions, a couple of naval patrol craft that we inherited from the British and no air force to speak of. Today, the SAF is a professional and integrated defense force capable of responding to a range of its traditional and unconventional threats. Jane's Defense Weekly, I think Mr. William mentioned this uh, reputable defense publication, and it is reputable, commented recently that, quote, the SAF of today is by far the most advanced military force in Southeast Asia, unquote. This wasn't achieved overnight. It is the result of a steady commitment to defense of, of 45 years of national service, which Mr. Ong Teng Kun highlighted. The success and progress of the SAF has been built through sweat and sacrifices of committed national servicemen, led by bright, dedicated, and capable commanders. I fully recognize that the SAF takes its fair and some say unfair share of bright people, and long may it be so because it is important. The SAF leverages on advanced technology to modernize our equipment and systems, to multiply our capabilities. There are three crucial factors steady, prudent defense spending, capable and committed SAF soldiers, the use of advanced technology. These three crucial factors have allowed us to build a credible defense force despite the unique vulnerabilities of a small country. When we started, no one believed we could build a credible defense force. These are the reasons why our frigates can operate with only 70 men, half that in other navies, or why our high-mobility artillery rocket system needs a crew of only three men compared to eight for other artillery systems which are shorter range and less accurate. Investing steadily over the long term allows MINDEF to keep a constant lookout for platforms with cutting-edge capabilities that can provide Singapore with that strategic advantage. For this reason, we joined the Joint Strike Fighter Program as a security cooperative participant back in 2004. The GSF, if uh, some members know, now the F-35, has the potential to be the most advanced multi-role fighter aircraft for decades to come. Though the F-35 is still in development, we are nonetheless interested in the platform for our future needs. The F-35 will be the vanguard of next generation fighter aircraft in operation. For the longer term, the RSCF has identified the F-35 as a suitable aircraft to further modernize our fighter fleet. We are now in the final stages of evaluating the F-35. So the interest of transparency, I'm telling you, we're now in the final stages of evaluating the F-35. MINDEF will have to be satisfied that this state-of-art multi-role fighter meets our long-term needs, is on track to be operationally capable, and most importantly, is a cost-effective platform. I've given many necessary caveats before we make a final decision, but we are evaluating the platform. Again, planning ahead, MINDEF is also looking to replace our aging Challenger-class submarines, which were built in the 1960s. The replacement submarines will have significantly improved capabilities and will enhance our ability to keep our sea lines of communication safe. Our plans for new fighter submarines the Army's recently operationalized Leopard tanks and Terex infantry carrier vehicles, the Air Force G550 airborne early warning aircraft, and the Navy's formidable class frigates with their Sikorsky naval helicopters, taken together, will ensure that the SAF remains a credible and effective force to serve our defense needs for the next decade or two. But many members here have said this, and I agree with them. Even if we have the most sophisticated platforms and systems, ultimately our defenses are only as strong as the resolve and the commitment of our people to defend Singapore and our way of life. In fact, I think we ought to be wary of complacency because we have a technologically advanced SAF. Because the temptation is always that because it's so sophisticated, you don't need the man in the loop. And that would be a tragic and costly mistake. Or to think that the peace in our neighborhood is a given. The security in our region can turn unpredictably. A decade ago, 
no one could predict that the territorial disputes would escalate tensions in the South China Sea. Or that a few hundred gunmen with rifles and grenade launchers would intrude into eastern Sabah. My family and I spent a very nice holiday in Sabah, I think one or two years ago. Idyllic, from mountain to sea within two hours. The base camp of Kota Kinabalu, very tranquil, the best goreng pisang I've tasted in a long time because they use a special kind of banana. Mi goreng also, as they say, very set up. And then you take a ride to the sea, World Heritage sites of that you can dive from the shore, natural corals. Who could have predicted that a few hundred gunmen with rifles and grenade launchers would go into Sabah? For the SAF, we have to ensure that above all, our NS men who form its backbone are capable and have the resolve to defend Singapore if ever similar circumstances fall upon us. This is why we must keep NS strong. So how do we ensure that our NS men continue to have their commitment and capabilities to defend Singapore? We talk about how the SAF has transformed itself into a third generation, the 3G SAF, we call it. But as members here have pointed out, we should be mindful that at the same time, Singapore itself has been transformed. A 3G Singapore, a very different one than that when NS was started 45 years ago. The city, the people, the values, the aspirations are not the same. Younger Singaporeans, our NS men today, are indeed more educated and talented. More PRs will serve NS. We have to respond to these changes and ensure that the commitment of a new generation of NS men remains strong. At the same time, we must find ways to use their abilities more effectively in the SAF. And I think Mr. Desmond Lee is correct. Meaningful roles that match their capabilities. I received an appeal recently. A young man going to full-time national service was downgraded because his x-ray showed some early changes in his spine. He had some back pain, so he went for an MRI, I think. But he feels fit and wants to be in a combat vocation. And in fact, wants to be an infantry officer. Such appeals are few. And we do get more appeals from NSFs who want to use their talents in the music, the arts, dance and sports during the NS. But the details are not important as the main challenge, which is that if our NS men feel that their abilities are being put to the best of use, and if they believe in what they are fighting for, it will engender greater commitment and contributions in building a stronger SAF. We may not be able to satisfy all the requests. In fact, we won't be able to satisfy all requests. I quite expect, after saying this, that I will get a deluge of requests for a variety of NS men who want to use their multi-talented, multi-talents to help the SAF. But we may not be able to satisfy all of them, but at the end of the day, we recognize that the SAF must be operationally ready and fighting fit. But I believe that NS men can and want to play a larger role than our, NS, our SAF if the commitment is there. Many here are good examples of this already. Mr. Tio Siong Singh and Mr. Zaki Mohammed, who have completed their ORNS. I asked Mr. Zaki Mohammed, he's only 38, how come you've completed your ORNS? He says, well, I've done 10 cycles every year, each year one. So he's completed it. Dr. Lim Wee Kiet, Dr. Chia Shilu, now serving the Navy. Mr. Nicholas Fang, Vikram Nair, Mr. Pritam Singh in the Army, and Mr. Desmond Lee in the Air Force. We often cite Finland for its strong education system. I visited Finland many times to study them. I give you a tip. You can go in winter and summer. It's actually only very cold or very, very cold. It makes very little difference. But worth studying. Less is known that, like us, the Finns also have national service. I think Mr. Lim uh, Dr. Lim Wicket mentioned it. In the Finnish system, the national servicemen can indicate how they want to serve in their NS. You decide what you want to do. You have a choice of vocation. And it does not end up in their system with the NS men only choosing the less demanding roles or the least demanding roles. Indeed, 
Some choose more demanding roles as pilots, intelligence officers, special forces, etc. Some choose to be officers or to be in vocations that lengthen their national service period. Because if you choose a particular vocation, you require more training, you're required longer to serve, and they choose it. This is a different organizing principle in their society that explains their national service and education system. If I can characterize it, there is a first hurdle in their system that all must cross to make sure that standards don't slip. But beyond that, the approach is springboards to success, not hurdles. Springboards to success, not hurdles. You choose how high you want to go and the springboard will be provided. Now, not all will jump gracefully. The dice won't be spectacular for some. But this approach encourages NS men to go higher and contribute more. Singapore is obviously not Finland. We have a different culture, security risk, needs and people. Compared to us, they are a much older society. Long history and certainly more homogenous. Comparing our NS systems, we have certain strengths and weaknesses and they have theirs. But I think we must adopt and adapt what we think are good practices from other systems to improve ours. In fact, the SAF already has a similar practice where we ask full-time national servicemen to indicate if they want to become commanders after they, have, they go through their basic military training. And I will tell you that the majority want to become commanders. In building commitment, it surely must be the right direction to maximize the potential and talents of NS men and allow them to play a greater role in our national defense. We should study how we can provide more springboards for national service. Secondly, several MPs too asked how we can better help our NS men meet their duties and recognize their efforts. I think Dr. Lim Wiket, Mr. Zainuddin Nordin, and Mr. Desmond Lee talked about this. Like them, I'm alive to the demands that national servicemen place on our NS, NS men. MPs here send many letters of appeals to MINDEF or to me on behalf of the residents. I read them and, I, and we look at them. Some examples. A Mr. Yu, who had dutifully served his in-camp trainings, but his next I ICT's in-camp training coincided with his first month of a new job. Another Mr. Charles, who needed to look after his mother who was receiving cancer treatment. In these deserving, deserving cases, we grant them deferment from their in-camp training. But I acknowledge that many do not get excused because their CO, their commanding officer, who is also an NS man, has decided that the individuals who ask for deferment are needed to get his unit operationally ready. And we should support the commanding officer because we entrusted him with the responsibility. This house, Singaporeans, entrusted the CEO the responsibility to get his unit operationally ready. And sometimes he has to make that difficult decision when people ask for deferment. MPs like Assistant Professor Eugene Tan and Mr. Hari Kumar in recent debates have also pointed out that some employers seem to discriminate against NS men in their work. I know that this complaint upsets all members in this house. It undermines a strong NS. MINDEF will work harder to reach out to more employers. Each year we work hard to motivate employers to support NS. I present awards to those who are staunchest advocates of NS, such as Yakun, Canon, and the URA, Urban Re Redevelopment Authority. But if Singaporeans know of specific employers who adopt unfriendly practices at their workplace towards NS men, please let me know and we will make best efforts to remedy the situation. Despite these demands, I think all MPs here support NS. I've not heard a single MP who, despite the difficulties and the demands that place on NS, who say, let's relook it. Some of you have shared their own positive NS experience and strongly affirm that NS is part and parcel of being a Singaporean. Mr. Ong, Mr. Hari Kumar, Mr. Pritam Singh. Some of you have suggested that we should make it part of the integration journey for PRs and new citizens, even albeit at a reduced level. Mr. Pritam Singh mentioned that. Mr. Hari Kumar has taught hard on this issue. 
and ask how we can better address those who renounce their PRs, such as through higher penalties or taxes. Whether you agree with specific proposals by various MPs or not, I think may not be important, as important as what we can all agree on, that NS is very much a duty and honour for all those who would make Singapore our home. That's the starting point. We in this House appreciate the commitment of our NS men and the sacrifices they make. All of us recognise that if we do not defend Singapore ourselves, no one else will. Each of us have to up uphold our duty to serve NS. But I also heed your calls that we can do more to match the abilities of our NS men, increase their engagement and commitment, recognise their efforts and find ways to help them fulfil their NS duties, even on a daily basis. Where we can, we should look into ways to reduce the impact on their studies, work and family commitments. MPC have raised many issues. Some of these issues have been raised by public members as well. To respond to this feedback, I have decided to convene a committee to strengthen national service. It will be called a committee to strengthen national service. I will chair the committee. There will be two working groups. Senior Minister of State Chan Chun Singh will lead the working group on support for NS to see how we can maximize the abilities of NS men for the SAF and help NS men fulfill their duties. We will also look into increasing support from various groups such as families, employers, schools, permanent residents, new citizens and the broader community. Senior Parliamentary Secretary Maliki will chair the working group on recognition and benefit for national service. I think that's some of the MP, MPs, including as I know, Din Nordin and others have asked for it. I want to say from the outset that I know that the committee will receive many requests. We will be open to views and ideas, but let us agree on common goals to set the committee in the right direction. Our most important goals are to strengthen Singapore, strengthen national service and the SAF, and serve all Singaporeans in that order. Important order, Singapore first, SAF and NS second, personal interest, all Singaporeans next. Often it comes in the reverse order, but we should set the direction right. The committee must ensure that the NS, the NS must still be focused on defending Singapore, that it is fair to all and universally applied, that it must engender a commitment and hopefully love for our country, we should avoid using this as an exercise to serve narrow interests or inflict unnecessary or unfair hardship on any particular group. That would be a negative outcome. This exercise must bring our nation together, not divide us. It must strengthen national service in Singapore, not weaken it. If we do this well, NS will have a strong support for many years to come. To achieve these purposes, we want to include in the committee and working group members with a good appreciation of the issues so as to provide good, workable and affordable ideas to strengthen NS. Good, workable and affordable. Obviously, MPs will be included and I hope you will not turn us down. We intend to consult widely with various groups of Singaporeans. We hope to complete the committee's work within a year. Let me now address other issues or update members. Uh, since the last time we met, there have been safety concerns and I updated the House in November and there has been some developments that I thought I would just quickly update you. We recently started the SAF Care Fund to allow the public to show their support for severe, severely disabled servicemen. Thus far, we have received one million in contributions, mainly through the generosity of the Lee Foundation and MINDEF will provide a one-to-one -one -one matching grant of up to 2.5 million to support this effort we intend to obtain institution of public character, IPC status for this fund. I have explained before that our compensation and welfare schemes provide significantly higher amounts and assistance at civilian schemes, but I want to be clear that we don't detract from our goal to prevent all injuries and death. And let me provide an update uh, in terms of security measures, or safety measures. I told the House last time that we wanted to create additional posts for full-time safety officers the first batch of these additional safety officers have been trained and sent to units and will report directly to their unit commanders. And this will ensure better compliance with safety, savings, regulations. I also informed the last time uh, the House previously that we would have start a SAF inspectorate for safety. Uh, on further review, we have decided to elevate this SAF inspectorate to a directorate for safety and systems review. 
As a directorate, it will report directly to PERM's Permanent Secretary of Defence and the Chief of Defence Force. The directorate will also set up external review panels which will submit recommendations to the Minister for Defence. The first external review panel will be on tra training safety and will include experts and professionals from outside the SAF to validate the safety practices in our units and determine if they match up with best practices of industries and other militaries. We decided to do this because rather than ad hoc committees form after the incidents occur, this standing panel will provide oversight and direction for the longer term. I think this way will be more impactful. Mr. Alan Lee and Lim Wee asked about our bilateral defence relationships with our neighbours and key partners. Our relationships with our neighbours are excellent. For Malaysia, we have regular tri-service interactions, right all the way from the Minister to rank and file. Last year, I've met uh, my counterpart, Minister Zah uh, uh, Zahid Hamidi, uh, I think six or seven times. He's recently been a little bit busy, so uh, I'll wait till he's less busy to meet him again. We've also reinforced our strong and close relationship with Indonesia in the past year, held our first joint-level counter-terrorism exercise last year, bilateral, and co-hosting the first ASEAN Maritime Security Information Sharing Exercise. Some asked for our defence ties with other partners. Uh, our defence ties to the US are strong, multifaceted, and mutually beneficial. Our F-16s, F-15s, and Apache helicopters train extensively in the US, because they have a larger training space. Just one tidbit of information. The training airspace for F-15s in the US is 100 times the size of Singapore. Uh, Ms. Ellen Lee asked about the LCS, the littoral combat ships. This is in line with the 1990 Memorandum of Understanding and the 2005 Strategic Framework Agreement, which our neighbours understand. The LCS will be deployed to Singapore on a rotational basis. Was, they will arrive next month. They will not be based here, but sail out and make port calls in the region and engage other re regional navies. Our defence relations with China are warm and friendly. I met with Chinese leaders, uh, then Vice President Xi Jinping and Defence Minister Yang Kuanlie during my visit there last year. Both Vice President Xi then and General Liang have expressed confidence that the defence relationship between China and Singapore could be further enhanced through high-level strategic dialogues as well as interactions and exercises, including exchanges between young officers. We're following up with specific programs to achieve this. Our ties with partners such as Brunei, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, India, France and Germany remain strong. I'm happy to report that we renewed the Air Force bilateral agreement with India last year, and this allows the RSAF to continue joint military training in India with the Indian Air Force until 2017. We also renewed the OKI Agreement with Australia, which allows the RSAF to continue its helicopter training in Australia until 2027. Ms. Allen Lee asked about our contributions to Afghanistan and the Gulf of Aden. Thank you for saying that our SAF has done a wonderful job. I think they will appreciate that. Over the last six years, we've deployed close to 500 servicemen to Afghanistan as part of the ISAF, International Security Assistance Force. The experience gained by our soldiers has been invaluable and we've incorporated many of the lessons learned in our operational doctrines and practices. Singapore will be completing our mission in Afghanistan by June this year. Our deployments in Afghanistan have supported the larger international efforts to prevent extremists from using Afghanistan as a base to export terrorism, including to our own region. And Singaporeans can be proud of our contributions to this effort. As for the Gulf of Aden, the SAF has taken over command of CTF-151 for a third time until June as part of our contributions against international piracy. And Ms. Allen Lee is correct. It's made a difference because piracy attacks have come down. Madam Chair, our strong defence today is a result of continuous and strong support from members of this House and Singaporeans alike to build a credible SAF. A strong defence is the bedrock upon which Singapore's peace and prosperity rests. We must continue to strengthen NS to build a solid defence. There are some questions which our members have asked, but I will defer it to after further questions and allow my colleagues, uh, Senior Minister of State Chan and Dr. Maliki, to respond. Thank you very much.